Hello and welcome to Guiding Assets, the flagship investment podcast for CFA Institute. I'm Mike Wahlberg, and I'm looking to do some myth-busting on the show today with Dr. Edward McQuarrie, Professor Emeritus of the Levy School of Business at Santa Clara University. A charter holders, you may have seen Dr. McQuarrie's article in this quarter's Financial Analyst Journal, which takes aim at a few of the assumptions we tend to hold dear in financial markets, including that stocks can be depended upon to outperform bonds over the long term, and that a negative correlation between bonds and stocks will help diversification work its magic on portfolios. Edward will be discussing his research on an upcoming panel with CFA Institute alongside research titans Roger Ibbotson, Jeremy Siegel, Rob Arnett, and others, but we are happy to get our questions in early. Welcome to the show, Professor. Oh, thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure to be here today. Now, there's lots we're going to cover today, but I want to start with the what and, and how that enabled you to poke holes in 60 years of established portfolio theory. So I'm tempted to ask, what have you done? All right. <laughs> But but before we get to those conclusions, I'll take the emotion out and ask it as, what did you do to improve the data? All right. So what I did, uh, Mike, was I took the U.S. stock and bond record back to 1792. And I generally get two reactions when I say that. And the first is, there were stocks and bonds trading in 1792? And the answer to that is yes. And then the second question is, Hey, didn't Jeremy Siegel already do this? And the answer to that is yes, but I had a huge advantage over Professor Siegel. I came very late to the party, okay? I came 30 years later. And the availability of older historical data on stock and bond returns has drastically expanded since the early 90s when Jeremy first put together his thesis of stocks for the long run. And to be very clear to your listeners, I didn't collect anything after 1925, okay? This is all pre-1925 data. That's where the picture changes, okay? And in terms of just uh, to anticipate a question that as now in the viewers' minds, well, what's different, okay? What changed in the new data? Well, what I found was that sometimes stocks beat bonds. Sometimes bonds beat stocks. And much of the time, stocks and bonds perform about the same. And here's the, if you will, revolutionary finding. Those three statements hold regardless of holding period. They hold for 10 years, they hold for 20, they hold for 30-year holding periods, on and on. Wow. And I do want to dive into each of those different conclusions that you had there. In, in terms of what you actually uncovered on that earlier data, you, I know you did a bit of digging around dividends, you addressed your survivorship bias. Can you talk a little bit about that? So I would guess that um, millions of people have read the editions of Jeremy Siegel's book, Stocks for the Long Run. I would guess over 10 million people have seen his iconic chart showing stocks going up, 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 and blah, 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 blah. Very few people went to the Journal of Monetary Economics uh, paper from 1992 and went to its appendix and said, hey, just what data did Professor Siegel get here? Maybe only one person said, oh, he got it from Sidney Homer's history of interest rates, uh, the bond returns. Maybe only one person said, oh, I got a copy of Homer's book here. Where did Homer get those yields? Ah, oh, he got them from Frederick McCulloch. Ah, oh, where'd he get those bond yields? Oh, he got it from Joseph G. Martin in Boston, Massachusetts, published in 1898. And I'm thinking... I grew up in Massachusetts. What bonds did McCullough use? Oh, Haverhill. We played them in track. Yeah, Tiny Burke. Well, why are we resting 19th century bond returns on the 150,000 face amount of Tiny Town X in New Hampshire from 1870 when there were railroads with, you know, bond issues? a hundred times as large. Then I kept digging and I found out that, uh, well, 
those New England municipal yields that uh, Siegel uses after 1857, they're not observed. Macaulay said, you know, I need to find the absolute lowest yield that could possibly have existed in 1871. So I'm going to get a range of good bond yields, and then I'm going to draw a line down at the bottom as what I think the lowest yield would be. So what I did did instead of Siegel is I went back to the new digitized record and I said, well, let's collect the bond prices. Let's calculate the return from the prices and coupons, not by interpolating from, how shall I say, mathematically constructed yields. And that raised the bond return for the 19th century considerably from uh, what Jeremy reported. Then to your point about survivorship bias, as I said, you know, in 1992, Jeremy used the best sources available, okay? But I got started in 2018, and I had the great benefit of Richard Silla at New York University. Starting in the late 90s, he'd gone back to, um, basically he'd sent a team out to ransack every single library in the Northeast United States looking for newspapers before 1860. And what he found was newspapers have been reporting stock prices since the 1790s. It's always been news. It's right there in the digit. Well, for him, it was right there in the paper record and the dusty archives. So by the time I came along, Siller has put together literally dozens and dozens, a hundred or more stock series. He's put them into a spreadsheet. He's wrapped them up in a bow. And there they are, waiting for me. Missing two crucial bits of information that Scylla did not collect. Number one, no dividends. Number two, no share counts. Hence, no capitalization weighted total returns. And that was, if you will, my unique contribution was, I found the dividends and I found the share counts. Now, I think we'll slow down the podcast too much if we dive any deeper here. Microphone back to you, Mike. Thanks for that background, uh, Professor. So you have better data now about dividend distributions. You reduced the survivorship bias, and you extended the time frame back significantly back to 1792. Now, your article is littered with the term non-stationarity. Can you tell us what is that and how does that explain what you found in relation to stock performance, correlations, standard deviations, and the role of dividend? So, Mike, non-stationarity is a phrase that you use to shut down any dinner party conversation that you're at, okay? It's uh, academies for the relationships are not stationary. They bob around, Okay. And let's take that uh, stock bond correlation that you mentioned, which is so important to asset allocation and portfolio design. You go far back enough in time, not only do you not see a negative correlation or a zero correlation, I can show you decades in portions of a century where stocks and bonds were correlated 90%, 0.90, okay? And then, you know, by just before the pandemic, the trailing 20-year correlation was down to about Minus 0.70, it jumps around. Standard deviation. Now, a little confession for you here. Um, Roger Ibbotson's Stocks, Bonds, Bills, and Inflation Yearbook. I'm one of those people, it's on the shelf here where I can reach for it, and I'm opening it you know, on the my desk more hours than I care to tell you over the past uh, five years. And if you're a regular reader of the SBBI, you know that the standard deviation of stocks is about 20%. Been that way for years in their record. You go far back enough in time, you can see the standard deviation of stocks down at about 12 or 10% or less, no different than bonds. So really, the, the point of non-stationarity is that anything you would use for portfolio design, whether it's the relative return of stocks and bonds, so-called equity premium, the correlation, the standard deviation, the contribution to dividends, not stable, not the same in the 19th century as the 20th century. See, and that was the great hope from Siegel's initial research. 
straight line all the way back 200 years, unvarying. Nothing ever changed. New data, lots of stuff changes. Yeah, and, and one of the effects of that lower survivorship bias was that it reduced the equity or X premium, to your point there. It's still positive, though, um, in, in the U.S., but it... Oh, oh, no, 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 Mike, Mike. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's not. Right, and that's, and that's within and across different, well, not across different regimes, but within certain regimes, right? So what, what, what causes, do you, do, do you, is it sort of the next project that you would look at to, just, to understand what causes certain regimes to pr behave in certain ways and, and others in others? Yes, indeed. That's, as we say in academia, a project for future research, okay? And uh, what that means, um, um, I wrote a conclusion section at the very end of the article, and I kind of divvied the conclusions into two, conclusions for investors and conclusions for financial analysts. And the conclusion for financial analysts is really the form of an invitation. Can regimes be predicted? Can we predict uh, a stretch of time where equities are likely to underperform or where bonds are likely to outperform? And don't know yet. And as a practicing academic, I have to say, you know, efficient markets, so maybe not. Yeah, and I mean, I mean, you talk to any number of quants, and they'll 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 often point you to the interest rate regime or whatever is happening in interest rates. And obviously, folks can point to the last forty years in a sort of a structurally declining interest rate environment and say, okay, that's given us exceptionally large returns from bonds relative to maybe their history, and and certainly relative to stocks. So, did you did your research uncover anything about sort of that relationship between interest rates and and the returns? Not specifically, but let me kind of uh, riff on your point there a little bit. So I'm glad you pointed out the late bond market rally of 1981 to 2020. We may have begun, Mike, the great bond bear market of the 2020s. Not clear yet. What is clear to me is that I'm sure in your business you know the phrase, Never confuse a bull market with brains, okay? And, you know, pretty much every investor alive today, and in particular, every portfolio manager alive today, is coming off 40 years of, you know, bond market, bull market. Happen to coincide this time with a stock market, bull market. Except for 1999 to 2009, let's not talk about that. Or 2022. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, well, well, they both went down then. And, uh, so what you see when you broaden the lens to 200 years of U.S. history, and I'm a consumer of research by Elroy Dimson and Brian Taylor and others on the international front. But when you broaden the samples, you just, you know, it's mix and match with one exception. There's only one multi-decade stretch in all of recorded history where stocks wipe the floor with bonds. And that was the preceding great bond bear market of 1946 to 1981, which in the early years of the SBBI dominated the record, making it so clear to Jeremy Siegel and many others that stocks are destined to beat bonds. Well, yeah, for those 35 years, Go back a little further. Things look quite different. Yeah, because you've said that basically there there is that post World War II recency bias that's that's driven a lot of these conclusions, right? Yes, a, to, to the point where you've described it as uh, these this relationship has been built on sand. Indeed, or not sand, just you know, left censored data from recent times and also U.S. centric data. When I put the final article together for FAJ, or I believe they prefer Financial Analyst Journal. When I put the final article together, I, you know, I spent a lot of time on investment forums and I knew what the ordinary listener to your show was going to say when I introduced new and different data before 1860. You know, you don't have to be Generation Z to say, man, that is too old. That is too long ago. I don't care. And so that's why the international data piece is in there. Okay. The international data piece, the number of times that stocks have performed 
poorly overseas, uh, the number of times you find an equity deficit overseas, that's easy to dismiss too for, forgive me, Mr. Canadian, but that's easy to dismiss too for the American investor because American exceptionalism. Who cares what those foreign investors got? Irrelevant to me. So the beauty of the uh, Financial Analyst Journal article is, hey, go back further in time in the U.S., looks different. Go outside the U.S., looks different. Maybe better data has really changed the picture. And that's what the paper is about. Maybe it's outside the scope of, of this study, but but say that was true that ex- american exceptionalism you know it worked it worked in the past is it uh does it hold up on a go forward basis oh on a global basis particularly you know elroy dimson generally buy, bounds things at 1900 and i use brian taylor's data from global financial data uh, he takes things many countries well back into the 19th century but sticking with dimson marsh and staunton their book triumph of the optimist in the Credit Suisse updates they've been publishing. You know, U.S. 1900 to 2020X, 6.6, 6.7% real compounded. World X USA, 4.4% compounded. Now, I hate those geometric means, okay, because they're so misleading. Your listeners sitting there, you know, stopped at a stoplight thinking 6.6, 4.4. What's that difference? 10 to 1 wealth difference after 120 years. 10 to 1. Assuming you could stay invested. That's that's constantly the, the challenge in our industry as well, right? It's to, it's to stay the course so that you actually realize the 6.1 and not something half that. Oh, and of course, you could uh, reinvest dividends in fractional shares with no commission cost. Right. So, so what what do you see then for the? I mean, we we've kind of talked in generalities about you know that it's not as clear cut. It's not a sort of a R squared of point nine. It's it's like there's in terms of uh, the relationship between um, the outperformance of of equities versus bonds. What what's what's the scale of what we're talking about here? Like how 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 upset are people going to get with your research? I have found from the beginning that a lot of investors don't like it if you challenge the stocks for the long run thesis. It raises their hackles. What do you mean I'm not going to be able to double my wealth every 11 years in the stock market? Jeremy Siegel said I could. You're saying I can't. I think I'm going to believe Jeremy Siegel, okay? Because I like this idea of doubling my wealth every 11 years, 6.6% compounded, okay? And, you know, the... For investors, the, the research has, um, has two, two action implications, if I may. Number one, no matter what your holding period, you cannot be certain that stocks will beat bonds. Okay, And I'll come back to this if we have time, that stocks will beat long treasury inflation protected securities, the new improved bond for the 21st century. <clears throat> you just you just can't be certain. And if you think about it, my research and that's going out 20, 30 years, you, you still can't can't sort of bank on that. Exactly. The really revolutionary part of what I found is that holding period doesn't matter. But if you're skeptical, let me give you the theoretical case for why my data is probably correct. Okay? And the case goes as follows. Investors demand a premium for bearing risk, okay? That's why stocks are expected to beat bonds, you know, because you're taking a risk. You can lose money in stocks. All right. In the Ibbotson and Siegel research, U.S. stocks never recorded a loss over any 20-year period that they examined. Well, I guess that means that stocks are not risky, 20-year horizons. But if stocks are not risky at 20-year horizons, why should you harvest an excess return? Okay. So, number one, the new findings of sometimes there's an equity premium, sometimes there's an equity deficit. Sometimes you make a ton of money in stocks, sometimes you don't. Okay. 
they kind of solve a conundrum that had emerged from uh, the diffusion of the Ibbotson Siegel research, which was, you know, hey, if stocks always win, why should stocks always win? There's no risk. So what I found was stocks do not always win. That means they're risky. And that means on a probabilistic basis, you're probably going to do well in stocks, particularly over the long term. I have an adult child. She's got a good job. Okay. She's maxing out her 401k contribution. I told her to put it 100% in stocks. And, and that takes me to a, um, another question here I had for you, Professor, which is, you know, we are an industry that, you know, we do need to boil things down to a certain point. Like these, these theories need to give us actionable tools and, you know, for portfolio construction, uh, you know, a big one for that is the efficient frontier. We sort of construct something that tells us what we understand about the relationship between risk and return between different asset classes. So what should the implications be for portfolio construction in your view on this? Do we need to redraw that efficient frontier? Go, I mean, to your point, they're not all bonds, I guess, but you know, what, where do we go from here? So what are the practical implications for the ordinary investor? Not the financial analyst writing a journal article trying to predict regimes, but the investor trying to decide, what do I do? Okay. The first implication is that, you know, if you're not 25 years old with a 50 year time horizon, you might want to go back to the Peter Bernstein portfolio. Listeners re may remember that in 2002, he said, you know, all things considered, 60 40 is probably the way to go. Okay. Now, in the Ibbotson Siegel world, 60 40 means you must underperform 100% stocks. In uh, the new data world, 60-40 means you're going to harvest the imperfect correlation between the two, and you may not underperform by that much over particular intervals. So that's the first practical implication. Uh, the second one is simply to understand that, yes, on the odds, probabilistically, a stock investment held for the long term it's probably going to make you big bucks, but it is a gamble. It's a wager because at other times it won't. And you have to be prepared for that. And again, and this is where I think financial advisors come in. I think a lot of clients don't really understand their risk tolerance. And the purpose of the paper is to say, are you sure you're ready for 100% stocks? Have you got the stomach for it? Yeah. And, and I, I Another thing I'd wanted to mention as well is I, I know that as part of your research, you you also looked at sort of the concentration of risk and where the sources of risk are within stock universes. I, I think specifically you were looking at the U.S. and comparing U.S. performance versus T-bills over, over time and that there was actually a very strong concentration of where all that return was coming from. That's actually the research from Henrik Bessenbinder at Arizona State. It's also appeared in the Financial Analyst Journal. He'll be on that panel that we're doing in a little bit. And uh, what Bessenbinder found was that in the United States post-1926, 4% of all stocks, and there were about 26,000 in his database, 4% of all stocks accounted for all the outperformance relative to T-bills. The other 96%, you know, just match the risk-free rate over their lifespan. And so you take that back to the new historical research. First of all, the sample size is much smaller when you go before 1871, when you go overseas, before uh, World War I, et cetera. In a lot of the new U.S. data, even with my expanded record, you're looking at samples of 25 to 50 stocks, okay? If there's one chance in 25 that you've got a star stock, well, randomly select some 20-year historical period, then what are the odds that there weren't any star stocks during that holding period? In which case, you would not expect stocks to, to even beat uh, bonds, much less bills. That's an astounding number that Bessenbender uncovered. Like that really makes the case in, in my mind for for active management. John Bogle, as you know, disagrees. Uh, and Siegel puts Bessenbender in the sixth edition of his book. You can read it on page eighty-five. But uh, uh, he says 
This shows that nothing but a broadly diversified portfolio is safe. There's no way to know who the 4% are in advance. And be careful here, Mike, or I'll have to quote Upton Sinclair to you. Well, on that, on that cue. It's difficult. It's, it's difficult to make a man understand something if his salary depends on his not understanding yes. it. <laughs> True enough. True enough. And let's talk about, uh, about our salaries. Uh, no, let's not talk about our salaries, but <laughs> that, that was an awkward segue to my final question for the interview today. And I'm going to adapt it a bit for you because you, uh, you know, have a long history in, in working in academia and now research specifically in, in financial services for the last sort of 15, 20 years. But if you think back to your first job, wherever that was, and if you could go back and take yourself for coffee on your first day, what key piece of advice would you offer yourself? In your 20s, your 30s, and your early 40s, you might as well go 100% stocks, okay? Because there's no prospect, assuming you're a prosperous individual, there's no prospect that you have to touch the money and you can ride out the volatility. As soon as your horizon starts shortening below 30 years or so, it, it, you're going to want to have to think about an asset allocation that includes fixed income, okay? Doesn't have to be a lot. We can debate what the fixed income source should be. You know, in about 15 years, they're going to introduce this thing called TIPS, and I would encourage you to take a serious look at it. And I guess at this point, uh, my uh, past self was uh, called to his class session, and uh, that was the end of the coffee. I've been speaking today with Dr. Edward McQuarrie, Professor Emeritus of the Levy School of Business at Santa Clara University and author of Stocks for the Long Run, Sometimes Yes, Sometimes No, published this month in Financial Analyst Journal. Thanks for talking us through it today, Professor, and good luck on your upcoming panel. Indeed, I'll lead it. I'm Mike Welberg, and this has been Guiding Assets. <laughs> <laughs>